will know that there's the raise your hand option as well. So if you just go to the little three dots, um, welcome Jake. Um, if you just go the little three dots, um, that's also where you get to the chat, there'll be a raise your hand option. So you can raise your hand and then um, once you've spoken, go back in there and lower your hand. So that's welcomed here. We can all add in stacks. Um, so just put your name in the chat if you're wanting to speak and we'll like go from that order. So that's a little bit about um, being together virtually. Then I want to pause and have a land acknowledgement. So I'm really grateful for the people at Stop Line 3 and Indigenous Water Protectors talking to us about how we are all treaty people and we all benefit from treaties and are impacted by treaties so we can all live that way more instead of how the US government has never acknowledged a single treaty. And so this is a part of us coming together to acknowledge treaties more and um, that we are all treaty people. Um, the land that we are with, the land that we are on, is land that has always been in relationship to the Dakota people and then the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk people as well. And um, the Indigenous people have always been stewards of this land. And um, then oppressive systems, cellular culture made blockages to that stewardship. So we come together with the intention to clear away blockages, open paths in ways that we all can from whatever means we can for indigenous leadership, indigenous water protectors, indigenous land stewardship. And so we just wanna honor that connection that indigenous people have been stewards of this land always and continue to, and that we all benefit from that and let us clear paths to continue that for them. Also, um, it's a way to honor that we all come from people who had a relationship with land and that oppressive systems divided us from that relationship or tried to divide us from that relationship with land, with each other, with bodies, with animals, with ancestors. And so we come together in circle to try to reconnect and come together instead of dividing. And so that's the intention with land acknowledgements is to honor the people who have been caring for this land that we all benefit from. And um, I'm grateful for all the people who I've learned from to be able to say this. Then I wanna talk about rights of Mississippi River. So um, rights of Mississippi River and Seldiff are hosting, co-hosting this event. A little bit about rights of Mississippi River is that um, we decided to remove the from acknowledging Mississippi River according to Robin Wall Kimmer talking about how the signals object, like the chair, we don't talk about the Caspian. So we're acknowledging the personhood, the living being that is Mississippi River. And so Mississippi, Rights of Mississippi River is a group that is trying to get the settler legal system and the mainstream culture to acknowledge that um, Mississippi River is a living being that deserves rights. Corporations have rights apparently, so rivers can have rights as well. And a part of personhood rights is having a guardian or a guardian ad litem. And this is our way of trying to have settler legal systems recognize indigenous guardianship of land by giving rivers personhood rights and then they have the rights to guardians. And so um, thank you for joining us in that intention, and um, you'll hear from a few other members tonight. I'm just really grateful for you joining. Thank you so much, and we'll pass it off to Seldif and Tish and Kai. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm Kai Hushka. I'm an organizer with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, uh, and joining me tonight is uh, Tish O'Dell, also an organizer with Seldef. Um, we are in, a, I guess, our fourth part of a four-part movement of sorts in um, concert with Rights of Mississippi. Uh, we uh, had a, a three-part conversation series leading up to this workshop tonight where we uh, had questions and conversation about uh, the Mississippi herself, uh, had a general conversation about rights of nature, uh, and then spent our last conversation circle with uh, one another, just talking about the, the possibility, the premise of rights for Mississippi River ecosystem, what that would look like, what it would take. Uh, and those were meant just to be kind of more casual um, 
you know, interchanges conversation. And tonight, uh, we'd like to kind of keep it that way as well. Um, but Tish and I do have some things we'd like to present to you. Uh, we've both been doing this uh, rights of nature community rights work for a number of years now. And uh, through our direct experience and through connection to others have kind of come to understand this, this landscape and want to share that with you as best we can. Um, it's a big topic, uh, rights of nature, uh, as well as a lot of what Caspian was speaking to in the sense of where our legal system comes from, how our governmental system works, uh, the power of the corporate form, uh, that in, in a relation to the environment itself, uh, how those who've been trying to do activism work on behalf of the environment, what they, what they face based on how the system is set up and arranged and functioning. So it's, it is a, a big complex uh, animal that um, we won't get through in the way that we probably should, uh, but we're gonna touch upon as much as we can. Uh, and hopefully with the conversation and input and experience of you here joining us tonight, we'll uh, hopefully end up at a further point than where we are at currently in sort of our understanding and maybe our energy and willingness uh, to engage in this, in this work. Um, we arranged the workshop sort of in, in two parts. The first is really to try to give a little bit of a background on rights of nature you know, what we mean by it, where it comes from, how it's evolved, uh, where it sort of currently sits, uh, both the potential as well as um, the challenges and the threats to rights of nature as it sits today. Uh, and uh, the second part really is to kind of present a couple of case studies of communities here in the U.S. that have engaged in this work, understand how they came to do it, uh, sort of make a comparison to how this work really is about movement building work, um, that it is very transformational in the sense of what it's aiming to do in the sense of uh, resetting our system. Uh, and the, to understand that means being aware of, of how one needs to move perhaps differently than activism has been done in other circles. Uh, and then really the last part of the evening is for, for you as a group really to talk with one another. I'll probably send you off into small groups for a little while, uh, just on what you've heard, what questions you have, and then we'll come back together to, to hear what that is, as well as to maybe spend some time talking about what it looks like to move perhaps the rights of nature work in your own communities, whether around the Mississippi specifically uh, or other ecosystems, depending on where you're at. We're making the assumption that most of you are from the uh, Minnesota area or greater Minneapolis area, but there may be others of you from, from further abroad. So that's where we're going tonight. Uh, we're gonna kind of bounce back and forth with uh, a bit of a slide zero presentation, uh, but mostly would like to be seeing your, your faces as much as possible and engaging with you. Tish, do you have anything else that you want to say to kind of kick us off before we, we get going? No, just to welcome everybody. Thanks for being here this evening with us. And um, yeah, as Kai just said, I mean, it's a huge topic. So we'll, don't think that, you know, after this, we're not gonna, you know, there's no test. Like, so you have to know everything about rights of nature because this is a big topic and hopefully the conversations will keep moving after tonight, so. All right, well, I'm gonna uh, pull up my screen here. Um, let's see here. Trying to find where I need to go. Give me just one second. All right. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so we, uh, we kind of frame this, uh, at least I titled this, I don't know if that came out in the invite, but I just did a, a workshop with a number of um, Waterkeeper Alliance people from the Western states, and they have been wrestling with what the world has looked like for them and the sense of the work they've been trying to do to protect waterways. And their consideration was the fact that we're at the 50 year anniversary of the Clean Water Act for those that uh, have been doing environmental work, uh, especially around waterways. You know, you've probably come across in one shape or the other around the, the Clean Water Act itself. And so the consideration was looking at, you know, how well has that worked? Uh, and do we really need to look 
at the next 50 years, let's say differently than we have been in the way that we're trying to do the kind of environmental protection. And uh, we had a really good conversation about rights of nature with, with that particular group. And they are also wrestling with the realities where we sit today environmentally and perhaps needing to look differently at, at how we both relate to land and how we actually act on behalf of the land. Um, as Caspian mentioned, you know, our system today is so predicated on um, really a, a different form of existence relationship than, than traditional peoples have in the sense of, of place and governance. Um, and rights of nature in so many ways is, is really about getting back to that, that balance that traditional peoples, first peoples have had. This first screen I, I put up there just to kind of give us a sense of where we're potentially headed here, which is, you know, our legal system doesn't see the rights of nature. It doesn't recognize nature as rights. And in short form, it sees nature as property, as a thing. Uh, and this picture here is from a story called Bears with Lawyers. It's an Australian author named Sean Tan, uh, which talks about how bears show up to court to basically take humanity to account for all of its actions against, against the bears. It's a, it's a very interesting story. And, um, but there again, it's, it's really about where, where does nature sit uh, within our legal construct, which is largely what, when we talk about rights of nature this evening is, is what we're referring to is legally speaking, you know, does nature have rights today? And we're starting to see how that is beginning to emerge. We're not there yet, but it's, it's starting to become uh, more of the case, more of the conversation uh, at various levels in different parts of the world, even not just here in the United States. Um, but as a sense of understanding what we're up against, we have to understand what the system looks like today. Uh, and as I mentioned, we don't have enough time to get into the deep history and the reality of, of our form of governance. But what I have up here is a picture of uh, from the Constitutional Convention, um, uh, discussing, debating, uh, constructing what has become the US Constitution. Uh, and the quote at the bottom is from someone in analyzing really the, the mindset of what went into the drafting of the constitution itself. So for those that are driving or can't see the screen, I'm just gonna read quickly what the quote says. It says, the revolutionary conception of a equalitarianism that asserted the rights of man apart from property and superior to property did not enter into their thinking as a workable hypothesis. And what Parrington, who the quote comes from, is saying is that those people, meaning the white men with property, who sat down and drafted the US Constitution, they really went in there to, to build a form of government that was about the protection of property, ultimately, uh, with the understanding that that was um, uh, really the key uh, means of actually creating a uh, uh, a balanced government in their mindset. And it was all through this property frame. So you can see already that the, the view of the construction of the constitution, uh, those who put their mental power towards it, uh, had a very different sense of, of how human beings were supposed to be associated to land and everything around it uh, compared to that of, of first peoples. Uh, but that is the structure that we, we live from today. So it's not something from just the 1780s, that's the current construct that we're operating from today. And that has informed other things like the uh, regulatory world that a lot of you may have been participating in, whether you've showed up to be part of hearings, whether you've joined legal suits, uh, that all still stems from this property orientation of government. So it's not separate from that, it's very much enmeshed in that. So you can maybe begin to see why it's been so difficult to do environmental protection when our own foundational governmental document really wants to see the, the world through a property lens. You know, where that comes from, of course, is even more deeply around colonization, English common law, other European powers who, who took on a different sense of, of white superiority, white supremacy and how that spread across the globe. Uh, but of course it wasn't just the physical movement, but they also brought the, the systems of law and systems of governance with them. And it's very much what we adopted here in this country. Uh, the two quotes up here, one is by W.E. Du Bois. Uh, the second is by a guy named Robert A. Williams Jr. 
Um, I'll read both of those quickly again for those that aren't able to see the screen or can't at the moment. The first one by Du Bois, he says, the reason for the world mastery by Europe was rationalized as the natural inborn superiority of white peoples, showing itself not only in the loftiest of religions, but in a technical mastery of the forces of nature. All this in contrast to the low mentality and natural immorality of the darker races living in lovely lands. Um, it comes from a really great piece as he's analyzing sort of the, the um, colonizing mindset and what needs to be rationalized and normalized. And keep in mind, it wasn't just in social practice, but the colonizers um, ultimately always put things into law, you know, that the rule of law really moved things um, beyond just the sword. Uh, so we see that even today in the sense of how things are articulated in law today and, and the power that it holds. Uh, but this is really the legacy of, of the U.S. form of government. And then to the doctrine of discovery, uh, at the, the second quote here, Williams writes that the doctrine of discovery and its discourse of conquest asserts the West lawful power to impose its vision of truth on non-Western peoples through racist colonizing rule of law. So this, this idea again of, you know, if, um, you know, if I'm a white European power and no other white European power has claimed it, then we will claim it, make it ours in order to use it. Um, so you see how that property lens gets perpetuated. And that doctrine of discovery, of course, is still active today, uh, very much felt, of course, by, uh, by first peoples, perhaps more understood um, than, than non-indigenous communities of, of, that, of that power of the doctrine of discovery. Oh, what we've seen, though, emerge in our own history of the work through CELDAF really is this recognition that our system doesn't work, that property orientation doesn't work, the regulatory system ultimately doesn't work, and there has to be a different way. And in, in our world, it really emerged from this, this idea of, of, of really of common sense that we don't have practical means to protect our communities, to protect the land base that we're a part of. And really unbeknownst to us as we started to do this work is that others um, had begun to really think about, you know, the Western legal construct and the idea of rights. And kind of the, the seminal piece that people will go back to if they study rights of nature <clears throat> comes from this piece called Should Trees Have Standing? And was by a gentleman by the name of Christopher Stone. Um, and again, as you can see here on the screen, it was this question of really trying to look at nature in a different way, to get away from that property orientation. So the two quotes I put up here is uh, from that piece. He says, I'm quite seriously proposing that we give legal rights to forests, oceans, rivers, and other so-called natural objects in the environment, indeed to the natural environment as a whole. So this is 1972, um, as Tish will, will bring up here in a little bit, <clears throat> you know, our first community that we work with uh, Tamaqua Borough adopted a rights of nature law in 2006. So you can see in the sense of movements how often, you know, the question of something new coming, something transformational happening uh, can take decades before it actually materializes. Uh, and so that mindset again of movements needs to be understood uh, in the sense of how these things move. The other interesting thing I think around what uh, what Stone puts forward, and I guess is again, this is looking at nature and the idea of rights through more of a constitutional legal construct. Uh, but I think it also applies societally as well when he says, the fact is that each time there's a movement to confer rights onto something new, some new entity, the proposal is bound to sound odd or frightening or laughable. This is partly because until the rightless thing receives its rights, we cannot see it as anything but a thing for the use of us those who are holding rights at the time. Um, so, you know, that, that question uh, eventually made its way into our work, even though we didn't have any sort of real understanding of that at the time. It's only been doing research that we kind of stumbled across people like Stone and all, um, a guy named Nash also wrote a, a book in the late 80s. Roderick Nash about rights of nature. And there's been other work in that sort of Western mindset um, before someone like Stone uh, coming in to talk about it. But our practical understanding came with really working with communities on the ground. Uh, and in the case of our history, it was working with a very rural conservative uh, Pennsylvania community who uh, basically had enough of how the system was working. And Tish is going to pick it up from here to talk about um, sort of the, a little bit around Tamaqua Borough and what brought them to be 
um, the first place to bring a rights of nature law forward, at least in that Western legal construct. Yeah, thanks, Kai. And you know, it's interesting because a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people who have, you know, looked at rights of nature, and if they've looked at our work, Tamaqua Burrow is obviously the first one that, like Kai said, that you know we worked with, and it's actually the first place in the United States that put rights of nature into law in settler colonial law. Um, and the stories are important. And so I just wanna give you a little you know, bit about the story because through the stories, I think you'll see that you can relate to these people in this community. Um, as Kai said, it was about adopting common sense. And that's what I always like to think of when I tell the story of Tamaqua Burrow. Um, they were sick and tired of sewage haulers in the region spreading foul smelling toxic sludge on their agricultural land. Um, and of course it was all legal. The state gave permission for this and people were literally getting sick. We actually, our first democracy school, we named it the Daniel Pennock Democracy School. And he was a 16 year old who rode his bike through the fields that sludge had been spread on and he got sick and he died um, from the sludge. And obviously the local government, you know, was felt powerless because the state approved this. So the community though, was not just under um, attack from sludge. I mean, there was other environmental th th uh, threats there. And what's interesting because that part of Pennsylvania, there was a lot of coal mining that had gone on. And so they had these pits that were left there. And so of course, you know, once you're considered a sacrifice zone it's like always considered a sacrifice zone. And so there was other, you know, now they wanted to dump fly ash in these pits. There was human and medical waste being proposed to come in from New York and New Jersey. It actually was being shipped there to dump in these pits. And it's funny because people still think, you know, when they say, where's the away? Like, we're going to throw it away. You know, we never think about that when we're disposing of our waste a lot of times. Well, the away is someone else's backyard. And most of the time that backyard is usually in poorer communities, both urban and rural, you know, and where folks don't have a lot of clout and fighting back. And of course the state EPA kept trying to, you know, tell the people in the community, don't worry about it, it's safe. We've tell, it's, it's okay. It's got the EPA approval. And it was only through community members getting together and talking, organizing, building community, you know, they discovered cancer and diseases like MS were on the increase there. Um, I'm gonna share my screen just quickly here. My slide. Just so you can see. Um, a little to give you a visual of what Tamaqua Borough, what it looks like, just a little town, rural, like I said, PA. Um, I'm trying to get to my full screen. Sorry, this is in the way. <laughs> Let's see. Oops, current slide. There we go. So after, you know, the community is building, more people are getting involved. There was um, a lady in the community. It always takes one, right? <laughs> Usually it does tend to be ladies. And her name is Kathy Miarelli. And Kathy Miarelli is mother of two. She was a school nurse there. She decided she had to act. I mean, this, this information that was coming out just motivated her. She couldn't sit back, do nothing anymore. Um, what she decided to do, and a lot of us make this decision, is to run for office. So she ran for town supervisor, and she won. Of course, she was only one of seven. Um, so it took a lot of work on both hers and the community's part to get support, you know, to try and say, hey, we need to do something. And it was in 2006, Seldef came into the picture. She found out about us. Um, and said, what can we do? And that's when Rights of Nature was like, let's try it, right? Um, and let's put some language in here that you can't do it, make it illegal. Well, it went to a vote of the council. There were seven, the vote was tied. And the mayor was actually the one who had to break the tie and he voted in favor of the Rights of Nature ordinance. So, you know, it's kind of interesting with just one little vote, this may not have happened. Um, but Tamaco became the very first place in the United States, like we said, to recognize rights of nature. 
in law and this one small act had ripple effect and it moved on. It took two years. That was 2006. And then in 2008, someone in Ecuador, who would have thought, right, sees this happening, found out about it. And it, then they, they were rewriting their constitution at the time. And so that's how it got into the Ecuadorian constitution. Um, I'm going to stop my share there. So again, you know, in your, don't think any time that the small effect, you know, what you're doing may seem like a small thing or it's inconsequential, but we don't know when we're talking about movements, what's going to be the next that's going to come along. Okay, you want to take it? Yeah, that's a good setup to really a, a something that's interrelated to the work, which is what we've discovered is rights of nature has become um, not only has it evolved in the sense of, of communities, nations, courts, uh, making rulings, having conversations, passing policy in, in the idea or in the name of, of nature's rights. Uh, but I think the, the topic itself has become somewhat popular, um, somewhat vogue in a way. Uh, and, and people get very excited about the, the ideas, either from what they've heard or, or that, that, that get invoked when they hear rights of nature. What often gets overlooked, though, is the understanding that the dominant system uh, is pretty much antithetical to the idea of rights of nature. Uh, that property orientation is very, very powerful. Uh, and it's found a way to make sure that the, the greatest economic actors are the most empowered to actually move on behalf of the protection of property for the sake of commercial development. And of course, that is, in, in most cases, the large corporate form. And so our, our legal system has made sure that the corporate form has received, in some ways, more rights than people, communities, and nature itself. Um, and with that understanding that rights of nature, in most places actually around the world, not just the United States, there's a need to really look at government itself beyond just the idea of, of extending out uh, protections for the ecosystems that we're a part of, but how do governmental decisions, decisions get made? So Tish talking about Kathy Mirielli and Tama, you know, Tamaqua Burrow uh, in a situation where the state had full control over what was going to happen in Tamaqua Burrow, that they were legally shut out of actually having decision-making power. And despite that, they not only moved a rights of nature law forward, which was bold by itself, but they actually moved it on the grounds of saying, well, we have the inherent right to self-govern where we're at, that we're moving a higher governmental standard than you are supposedly putting in place that are supposedly for our protection, yet we understand that it's actually to our detriment. So uh, what needs to be understood is that, that there is a power dynamic here that decentralization of power is critical, that the right of self-government is critical, the right to protect is critical. Um, so uh, as part of tonight, we'll kind of come back to this at a few different points, but we wanted to point out how uh, not only give the contours of rights of nature itself, but to, to remind everyone that the governmental structure is very much a part of the rights of nature movement structure. And so um, Nothing really here to read too closely, but just as a reminder that this idea of decentralizing power, the right to self-determine is very, very critical uh, to the potential of rights of nature itself. Uh, and the language here I pulled out of was out of the Lake Erie Bill of Rights from the city of Toledo. Uh, the first piece is, is really part of their Bill of Rights. So that first paragraph there came out of their Bill of Rights that was part of the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. Uh, and as a critical piece, they talked about the people of the city of Toledo having this right of self-government. Uh, and with that right, we're then going to secure rights for nature itself. Later in that ordinance, if you read it, it talks about enforcement. And in this case, you can see that the bigger paragraph talks about Lake Erie's rights needing to be enforced. And, and of course, if you're gonna go into a human court of law, well, humans somehow have to be involved to act on behalf of the natural ecosystems. And so what was written into that law was basically not just a deferring to the governmental body itself, not just saying that the governmental body of the city of Toledo should have the ability uh, to help protect Lake Erie, but the resident or residents should be able to do so. So that access could come from the people itself, not just the governmental body, 
because um, you may have experienced that at times the people may want something and your own government, local even, uh, is unwilling to act in your behalf. Uh, the idea of rights of nature to, to get to where it needs to go. We need the ability to, to act on its behalf, to enforce the rules, to, to stand up for nature if it comes to that. And so as we're looking at policy at local laws or higher level lawmaking, uh, how critical it is that we also understand you know, how that power dynamic works and really that the governmental system itself needs to be questioned in a lot of ways, not just how environmental laws are set up and why we need to move to a rights of nature paradigm, but really how government itself is ordered and where authority lies is, is critical to, to rights of nature in itself. Um, I'm gonna pause there just for a second. We, we do have time built in for just a general kind of Q&A, but before I hand it off to Tish, are there, are there any burning questions, comments, um, observations to this point um, before we kind of keep, I feel like we're kind of talking at you and I wanna try to temper some of that. Could you just review those registers you talked about? You talked about needing to understand the dynamic and power of how governance works, but then you also talked about a couple different registers, uh, the regulatory process, and if you could just recap those last few sentences. Yeah, so if we take Tamako Borough as sort of a case example, you had a community that was facing to them a, was a threat, you know, the toxic waste dumping. Um, the way that the legal system is set up in that situation is that the state government has authority over how that operation of waste dumping is going to look. And in that process, and it's not just with waste dumping, if you look across all kinds of industries, uh, the state will capture ownership or authority over that and they will dictate downward uh, to you at the local level. And often in that dictation of power downward, they will disallow you from any, any power over even the regulation of X, Y, Z, uh, but most clearly usually that you have no authority to, to say no to the toxic waste. So that's one of the first things that Tamakwa Borough ran into was the fact that the state's regulatory system uh, has allowed this, they've permitted this um, and they've rationalized it. So they've used the same sort of colonizing mindset to rationalize things, to then rationalize that it's okay to destroy the environment so long as you only do it at this rate of speed at this amount of volume. And so this is what Tamakwa Borough was facing. You know, in conjunction with that, often these regulatory laws that are being adopted by state legislatures are coming at the behest of industry itself. So if you take the oil and gas world, um, a lot of your oil and gas acts of your states, if you were to look into your state codes, uh, you'll probably find something like an oil and gas act, which talks about oil and gas exploration or transportation or distribution. And they'll explain how that's going to function. And within that, they make sure it's very clear that the state government will have authority over that. And they will dictate downward as to what you can or can't do in those realms. And usually within that are very explicit to disallow your city or your county from saying no to it. So you run into to corporate power through the protection of the state. So often if we say it or others say the corporate state, <laughs> It's the corporate state that's dictating your existence uh, and dictating the existence in a place like Tamako Borough, for instance. So they had some big questions to consider, which is, do we follow the script as it's been written by somebody else or do we rewrite the script? Uh, and in their case, they decided we need to rewrite the script and we're doing it on the basis that we have the right of self-government and they were willing to take that challenge. In addition to that, when they started to look at the environmental world, they saw that environmental laws are really mostly about allowing the environment to be harmed in some way. Um, and they decided that that wasn't adequate, that really we need to take a different approach, which is really protecting the environment, protecting our land base. And in this case, on behalf of nature itself, which is very radical, at least in Western law, to really look at the community of nature itself for nature's sake, not seeing nature as a resource for human benefit. And so to construct that law and adopt it was also very radical for them to do that. So that combination of understanding where does authority lie, understanding really what, what, what is needed or what we want versus what we can get within the, what the system provides, and then understanding how that full system works 
today. So we have a very hierarchical, hierarchical system of governance that's very much about centralizing power, preempting local power, and ultimately in a lot of ways, privatizing our own existence to the benefit of the corporate form. So when Tamako Borough did what they did, they also were going up in some ways against the US constitution itself and its property orientation. So it's about digging that deep and the rights of nature work really is interlinked to all of that if we're going to get there. And we'll talk about it in a little bit about where we think we are at collectively in the rights of nature that there's different phases, but without dealing with that governmental structure and corporate power itself, I think we undermine our capabilities of what rights of nature can be. I hope that helps. I see Teresa put her hand up. Yeah, I just, I had a question about um, that I wrote in the chat, but I'll bring it up here is, because um, imagining how to do that, I live in rural Minnesota next to Minnesota River and ha imagining how to do this when there isn't like this overarching uh, threat against humans and how to, you know, get a city council, for example, to consider these when there isn't a problem that you have to address necessarily. Yeah. No, like not a, a problem in their terms. Yeah, that's a great question. And we're hopefully going to leave a decent amount of time at the end for you to kind of talk with others here tonight about that question and then us as well. So um, I think also when you hear a little bit about um, Toledo and their work, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Lincoln County, Oregon and their work, you might get some sense of how things built, and that may give you some ideas about how it may look in your own community. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, I mean, we're, we're all under threat. I mean, we're all on this planet. So, you know, that idea, but it is, and I, I tried to answer that most, a lot of the communities, it does take that, that harm, that threat coming at immediate where it seems to motivate, you know, the humans are in danger in the community. And so that gets people engaged. Um, but hopefully as this moves forward, that won't be the case because actually we all are under threat. And the only other thing I wanted to add to what Kai said is, you know, rights of nature and what they did in Tamaqua and all the communities that have done it, it's actually a form of civil disobedience in itself because just by proposing these laws, putting them forward, passing them, because the state's going to tell you you can't do it. I mean, because it's illegal. And the way the laws are written now and the way the constitutions are written now, it is illegal but you do it anyway. So, you know, when you think of past movements that kind of took that approach, I mean, who's writing the law and for whose benefit, you know, that's the thing. And just because it's a law, it doesn't mean it's just. So if you keep following unjust laws, and I always think of this, you use the civil rights as example here, you know, there were laws that said people couldn't sit at that lunch counter or drink out of that drinking fountain. You know, you break the law you challenge that law. And so that's what rights of nature, that's where we're at right now in the movement. Do you want me to just go ahead, Kai, into the timeline kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's a good way to kind of pick up and give people a sense of, and like we said, we're, we're not giving you as much as we could just because there's, there's so much to do. But um, yeah, Tish is going to give just a general sense nice. of where we've gotten to. And yeah. Yep. So, you know, this movement, it's about 20 years now and it's built over the past 20 years and I always say to people sometimes when you're in the middle of a movement and in the midst of it it's difficult to see the progress that's happening because you're focused on your local efforts and your local community and a lot of times you know I mean be honest I mean the news a lot of times isn't good right you get challenged it's like you're going up against this huge goliath um, of an enemy right to try and make change. And so it doesn't always seem good. I mean, a lot of people want to give up because it's hard work. And so um, what we did, I'm going to share my screen again with you, is we put together um, a graph. And part of this graph is to show you the top line is community rights, because community rights really go hand in hand with rights of nature. Um, it's the same system that crushes us in our communities when we try to um, take on social justice issues. You know, it, it's the same system in place 
that prevents us from protecting our environment and nature. And we won't get into all that now, but the top line is community rights work and the bottom line is showing rights of nature. But the good news is you can see they're both going up. <laughs> That's the trend. So this is supposed to be, you know, showing you and giving you some positive news here. Um, that this isn't just theoretical, that it's really growing. And it's an invitation for others to continue growing this. So we wanna keep these lines going upward. Um, I guess part of it is, you know, we're planting seeds and that they're sprouting in so many places, just like Tamaqua went to Ecuador. Um, this has been happening all along. And it, this isn't all inclusive, but it's just a list to let you start seeing some of this and that we have to start thinking globally, but acting locally, I guess. And the very first dot at the bottom, which you won't be able to read probably, but that's 1998. And it was Wells Township, Pennsylvania. And they were fighting corporate agribusiness. And they passed um, a bill of rights challenging corporate rights. So it didn't have rights of nature in it, but this is the precursor to then what led to Tamaqua in 2006. And also in 2006, there was Barnstead, New Hampshire, and they had a water withdrawal issue. They were fighting Nestle Corporation, again, a small town, um, and they were challenging corporate rights. So why does Nestle get to come in and take the water and bottle it and sell it somewhere else? So it's starting that mindset, you know, of people starting to see that the system is skewed. It's not working, like, why can't we make these decisions? So then in 2006, is when Tamaqua passed. Um, I'm gonna put up this timeline. I know those of you who can't um, see the screen, but it's just a list of some of these that's easier for you to read than on that um, graph. We talked about Ecuador already. And then in 2010, um, Pittsburgh. So, you know, a lot of these were small rural areas, but in 2010, it went to a city. You know, and there was a lot of pushback happening in these progressive cities at the time, more so than in these small rural towns. And it was city council that passed the law in Pittsburgh, so it wasn't a law that was proposed and voted on by the people, but the people had a huge influence. So it wasn't just that the council one day woke up and said, oh, we should put rights of nature law in to protect us from the fracking that's being proposed here. It was the people and the organizing that went on. It wasn't CELDEF that won over city council. Um, it was the community that put pressure on the council to then pass that rights of nature law in a major city. And you can see it spreading um, Columbia in 2016, 2017. We've got New Zealand Parliament um, granting rights to the Wanganui River, giving it legal status as an ecosystem. We have India. Um, the Ponca Nation in 2018, you see the White Earth Ban um, adopting the rights of Manuman, and Kyle talk about that a little bit more later on. Uh, and, and then in 2019, we had Toledo, which adopted the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. And that was the first time in US law that it was a specific law securing legal rights for a specific ecosystem. So the lake itself and some of those earlier ones, the, the wording is different. It's just um, not naming a specific ecosystem. Um, so you can see that it's definitely spreading and the list goes on. You can see 2020, um, it just keeps going on and on and on. Um, and the indigenous people obviously are playing a huge role in this because obviously this is a cultural shift that's going on for non-indigenous people. This isn't part of our culture um, to recognize. We've been so separated from nature. Our laws reflect that, um, a lot of things in our culture. So we always talk about, and in Toledo, when I worked with the community there, it got huge media attention, even though this wasn't anything really new, but for, you know, the white settler colonial mindset and in that framework, it was very new and it garnered a lot of attention and it flipped some, a lot of switches in a lot of people's brains and they made the connection between, well, if the corporation has rights and we have these corporate rights and they're beating us over the head with them in our communities, of course it makes sense that nature should also, it's a, li they're living, nature's living, the ecosystems were living and it, that they should have rights. Corporations aren't even living. 
So again, just to give you um, a taste of this is a movement that's growing. Um, it's going to pose challenges for us. And we're going to talk a little bit about those too, because we don't want it to just become a fad and get co-opted. Um, we want this to actually grow and become a real movement for real change that's meaningful. You want to just flip to the next uh, slide sure. where we've got some of the language examples. Sure. I can't get my box out of the way. <laughs> Let's see. How's that? Is that better? Yep. Okay. Um, the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, just to show you some of the language in the Lake Erie Bill of Rights and how it talked about nature. So it says Lake Erie and the Lake Erie watershed possess the right to exist, flourish, and naturally evolve. The Lake Erie ecosystem shall include all natural water features, communities of organisms, soil, as well as terrestrial and aquatic sub ecosystems that are part of Lake Erie and its watershed. Um, so you can see, I mean, Kai showed you earlier, yes, there's also, it's tied into the rights of the lake are the first rights that are put in there. They do include in there the right of the people, that the people have a right to a clean and healthy environment. So that that's what the people, but that they realize that's all dependent on Lake Erie being and the ecosystem being healthy. So that language is tied together in the law. And if we look at Ecuador, Ecuador um, was the first country to carve out rights of nature in its constitution. And it's in chapter seven. And you can see what's important, they put nature has the right to restoration. And this integral restoration is independent of the obligation on natural and jur juridical persons or the state to indemnify the people and the collectives that depend on the natural systems. So in its own right, in the cases of severe or permanent environmental impact, including the ones caused by the exploitation on non-renewable natural resources, the state will establish the most efficient mechanisms for the restoration and will adopt adequate measures to eliminate or mitigate the harmful environmental consequences. So this right, this idea um, that nature has the right to be restored. Toledo did put also in their law um, something about that and that, you know, restoration, the city of Toledo, if a court did give funds, it had to be used to restore um, Lake Erie and the ecosystem. Now, this is a movement and we're learning. Like each time, you know, one of these happens, it's a learning process and we're evolving in this. And so Ecuador, you know, I don't wanna make the, it sound, you know, all perfect because it does fall short because in article 74, they say persons, communities, peoples, and nations shall have the right to benefit from the environment and the natural wealth enabling them to enjoy the good way of living. Environmental services shall not be subject to appropriation. Their production, delivery, use, and development shall be regulated by the state. So, you know, that could be a problem when the people aren't involved in establishing some of this. So this, because we've seen already the state is very easily co-opted. So, you know, we've learned from some of that language, the newer, the ones we're helping communities propose, we're showcasing that and saying, hey, you need to be aware of this. So changing some of the language. Yeah, Kai, you uh, about the white earth? No, yeah, does it, I mean, just to say that's a good point in the sense that this is still ever evolving in the sense of how these things get articulated. It's also one of those things that as litigation may come up, you know, that will also prove to kind of give a better understanding of how the language needs to be constructed. Um, so, you know, with that, there's, there's still a lot of learning. And what we've discovered over the years is that as communities engage in this, that becomes helpful for other communities, which helps other communities. And so the more that we understand, the more we connect, the more that this will evolve into really what it needs to be. And so this is kind of what you're seeing here. I mean, Lake Erie 2019, you know, Ecuadorian Constitution 2008, uh, the Rights of Manuman 2018. So we have kind of two more recent ones and one from, from a while back, uh, um, you know, one from a you know, municipality, one from a federal constitution. And the last example, just to give you a taste of language, this is from 
uh, the White Earth Nation, so not not too far from from Minneapolis there. And this is a section from from that. There's more in that in that law, but this is the section we just pulled out just to give you a sense of of the language used there. So. Rights of Manuman, Manuman or wild rice within the White Earth Reservation possesses inherent rights to exist, flourish, regenerate, and evolve. So you can kind of see some of that parallel language that was in the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, um, as well in here rights to restoration, recovery, and preservation. These rights include, but are not limited to, the right to pure water and freshwater habitat, the right to a healthy climate system and natural environment free from human caused global warming impacts and emissions the right to be free from patenting, as well as the rights to be free from infection, infestation, or drift by any means from genetically engineered organisms, transgenetic risk seed, or other seeds that have been developed using methods other than traditional plant breeding. So, you know, here's, in this case, a tribal nation articulating a rights of nature law specifically for, for the wild rice and the realities of what makes for a healthy ecosystem for the rice for all the various reasons, not just uh, the use of it for, for diet, but of course, you know, the cultural and other, other realities of what that, what that means to, to the nation there. And so this was their language to articulate what, in the, what the law needed to contain. And like I said, there's more there if you haven't read it, we just wanted to give you a sampling of, of how different rights of nature laws have been articulated. Um, if you can unshare for a second, Tish. We have one more uh, element to share with you, and then we'll we'll take some questions before we take a quick break and move into the second half of the workshop tonight. The last thing that we wanted to to really point out is kind of where rights of nature sits, kind of in the movement trajectory. Uh, and so one of our colleagues has sort of looked at rights of nature as as being in phases, and that he sees it as really three distinct phases. So we wanted to kind of lay out quickly what those phases are. And then Tish was going to speak to what you mentioned earlier, which is, you know, not only the potential, but some of the some of the, the challenges or threats really to rights of nature and what we need to be aware of, uh, you know, in the sense of where we've gotten to and um, that understanding of, of sort of the diligence that's needed. So what we have here is sort of an, an, a, a quick analysis of trying to see rights of nature and sort of, a, again, that movement orientation or, or phases. And the first phase is, is back to Christopher Stone, sort of if you have no rights, then those who have rights just can't really conceive of the rightless containing or holding rights. And so that, that unthinkable phase, which if you think about it, Tamako Burrow, 2006, um, you know, I can remember being involved in uh, rights of nature efforts a couple of years after that. Uh, and any time that that notion of rights of nature was brought up, it was attacked as being laughable. You know, you want to give rights to trees and you want to give rights to rocks and I won't be able to mow my lawn. And, you know, all, all the ridicule would be, would be lobbied and, you know, attacked in the sense of the ridiculousness of the concept. Um, what we've found over time is that we've we've moved really out of that phase, um, and I think uh, L, you know work like Lake Erie and Toledo was was a big push, as well as others leading up to that point to move it out of that first phase. So it's it's no longer unthinkable, it's no longer uh, able to be ignored, it's no longer laughable. It's really into that second phase now, uh, which is well, how does it work? So this is that the mechanisms, you know, the mechanics of it all. And so what's written here is we are at the point in the movement for rights of nature that is not enough just to articulate the conceptual shift from ecosystems as property to rights bearing ecosystems. We must now advance legal mechanisms by which ecosystems will have rights and avoid the pitfalls that will recuperate rights of nature back into the colonialist capitalist white supremacist patriarchal system. So you're right at this, this cusp potentially, at least in this country of, of moving it even you know, further than where it's come from. Um, but with that, it's also uh, under threat of potentially sliding back into the existing system. So this is why we've reinforced that you can't ignore governance and who makes governmental decisions. You can't ignore corporate power uh, as you try to advance rights of nature. All of that needs to be considered because that system will continue to exist if, unless it's dealt with. And so rights of nature by itself isn't enough uh, to actually move all that. And if we want to articulate rights of nature, uh, in a way that most of it's been articulated so far, 
uh, we have to be diligent. You know, other movements have understood that when they've had an analysis, sort of a frame of what needs to change, they haven't let go of that frame. And we're in that stage with rights of nature where we have to be very, very aware, very cognizant that we don't let it backslide into the existing system. And so if you make it out of that, you know, then you're into this third phase, which is if we're able to really get it there, uh, one of the biggest contenders that we have to deal with is really the corporate form uh, and how we have to actually deal with things like corporate constitutional rights. Uh, and the example that we have in our own history is think about the Civil War amendments of the 14th being you know, the right to equal protection and due process. Uh, and those who know that history understand that that 14th Amendment uh, right uh, was largely exercised and enforced to the benefit of the corporate form more so than it was for, for freed slaves. So for the, the black population that now uh, was seen as more whole or seen actually as rights bearing, really seen as people for the first time under the law, um, they weren't really able to exercise the 14th Amendment, but the corporate form was. So this idea of, of power crawling into advancements of rights to its benefit, uh, we can't ignore that. And so that's why it's so critical that if rights of nature, for instance, evolve beyond just being in, in, embedded in um, local government that makes it to state and the federal level, uh, we have to understand that there's a whole other system going on and we have to be, again, diligent about dealing with that. Otherwise, rights of nature itself is, is, is not going to materialize in the way that we would like it to. So uh, we bring this up just, again, to be aware and the movement orientation of kind of where we sit and what needs to be understood. And Tisha is going to talk about, you know, some of those um, challenges, some of those threats to to basically downgrading or greenwashing or watering down rights of nature in a way that really wouldn't be beneficial to nature itself, as well as human communities that depend on it. Thanks, Kai. One of the things too, I wanted to point out because we know the Lake Erie Bill of Rights was sued. They were sued within 12 hours after passing the law. And just to give you a little flavor for um, how the court and the system looked at the Lake Erie Bill of Rights and what they said about some of the language, um, this is right from the decision. And they said that the Lake Erie Bill of Rights has already injured the state, at least on paper. So when you think about that, how ridiculous on paper, like, so it, it, they didn't even have time to use their law right, in any way, but they've hurt the state on paper. And they said the state could also be sued under the Lake Erie Bill of Rights for failing to sufficiently protect Lake Erie. Yeah, like, no kidding, that's what they were trying to do. You aren't protecting it. And then the farm, the corporate farm who sued, also falls within the Lake Erie Bills of Rights um, crosshairs too. The business spreads fertilizer on fields in the Lake Erie watershed arguably infringing the watershed's right to exist, flourish, and naturally evolve. So the risk of lawsuit under the Lake Erie Bill of Rights is particularly high because enforcement does not depend on government prosecutors. Toledo residents may file suit themselves. So, you know, they very much know exactly why this law is a threat to them. And so that's why they need to make sure they tried to squash it immediately and didn't want anyone else to try and take it up. And he also makes the comment, the judge, he said that the authors of this law failed to make the hard choices regarding the appropriate balance between environmental protection and economic activity. So in other words, it wasn't the choice they would make, right? <laughs> so I just thought you would like to hear some of the language that the court system's actually using. They're not gonna be the ones that are gonna make the change right now. They'll be the last to change. The laws change, so the culture changes, the people put pressure on the laws to change, and then the courts will be the last. Um, so anyway, back to opposition and the threat of, you know, great deep greenwashing and co-optation of rights of nature. Um, you know, rights of nature expands rights for both nature and the people in the local communities. And so whenever rights are expanded, that's about shifts of power. And it's about shifts of power from those that have all the power over to the rightless. And so they're losing that advantage. So of course, 
they're not going to be all thrilled. The people who own the property and have the power and have all the decision making are not just going to sit by and let this happen. So that shouldn't be any surprise. We should be fully prepared for that. Um, also, as the movement for rights of nature grows in popularity, we have to be careful. And one recent example we had was in Florida. In October 2019, the Democratic Party of Florida passes a resolution that includes the following, it recognizing and protecting the inherent rights of nature as we have done for corporations. And that grabbed a lot of headlines for that effort. You know, it was also a, for, to get votes, right? It was um, coming up on election season and Florida has a ton of water issues. And immediately there was a bill introduced um, when the Florida Democratic Party brought this up as part of their platform. And the bill was brought up to preempt any rights of nature um, laws from going forward. And it, it, the legislator who introduced this said, you know, there will be chaos. This is gonna tremendously damage the economy. He warned of all this litigation that was gonna cost cities and developers millions of dollars. Um, so all those things, you know, again, you, you can't have this. Well, so the Democrats, you know, came out and said, oh, yeah, we're for rights of nature. But when these preemption bills came out, guess when the vote happened? They all voted for these preemption bills on rights of nature. Unanimous. All the Republicans and all the Democrats. So there's one public face where they're trying to use it to get votes. But then behind the scenes, they're voting for the preemption law so that no community can pass any rights of nature laws. Um, we also have to be careful. There was a law also passed, you may have heard about it, in Orange County um, that claimed to be rights of nature laws. And one of the things that happened um, with that law is, of course, we you know, applaud any community that takes on and takes the efforts wanting to protect nature and wanting to protect the water. But that ordinance, what happened is it wasn't actually drafted by the community group, um, people who were really concerned about protecting it. They let the elected officials draft the law. And they put things in like, um, the right to clean water was only for citizens. And then they defined the legal status of citizens to people who have legal residence in the United States. So in a way, you know, that undermines the rights of undocumented people and the human rights um, parrot, like that the UN recognizes we should all have a right to um, clean water. So there was a problem with it there. They also, um, it banned any governmental agency, non-natural person or corporate entity from intentionally or negligently polluting the water. But then it defined pollution in the context that the state defines it as. So again, letting the state define what is pollution is a problem because their idea and what the people in the community might define it as are complete, could be completely different. That's what we're seeing when Kai talked about the regulatory measure. Um, additionally, you know, they, what they did is, you know, they capitulated and said, we want to keep this, it will stay in harmony with any superior state and federal law. Well, that also is a problem. We've got to challenge those state and federal laws that allow for the destruction of nature and looking at nature as property. So it really, it sounded kind of good and it made a lot of headlines, but when you really cut to the, you know, meat of it, and what it actually said, this is the kind of thing that we have to be worried about in the future. So it doesn't get co-opted, the rights of nature. And in the end, you find yourself, oh, yay, we have this. We think we have this. And it, then you try to use it and you find out it's not doing what we need. We've already had that with the Clean Water Act, you know, the Clean Air Act, and we don't need to duplicate that whole system. Um, Kai, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add or if we, I'm looking at the time. Yeah, I'd like to just turn it back to the group for a couple mm -hmm. minutes and then maybe we'll take like a like a quick three, four minute break and then we'll jump into the second half. So but before we cut out for a break, um, again, other thoughts, comments, thoughts percolating that people want to jump in with. Uh, I, I just have a question. What is the schedule for the remainder of the workshop? Uh, are you are you going another hour? What is your plan? 
Yeah, I think we we have another about, I think, um, 40 minutes. And then I think the Rights of Mississippi group, um, remind me, I guess, how much time you guys need at the end, and I can answer that better. Uh, it's like five minutes. Okay, so we got about 45 minutes or so. And the idea was to do a, basically a fairly quick um, kind of case study of two communities and then turn it over to you guys to have some more kind of smaller group discussions. So we've got another about 45 minutes after we take our break. All right, I'm gonna just get this rolling and as people head back in, um, you will catch on. So what we wanted to do in this, this second half was is, is really kind of get down to some of the, I guess the more uh, on the ground practical conversations. So maybe getting back to a little bit what Teresa asked earlier about, you know, I live somewhere, what does this look like? And how do I, how do I get engaged in this work? So um, we thought we would give uh, a little bit of a case study on two different communities that we've worked with just as examples. And I guess to more directly answer your question, Teresa, it is a lot more difficult when you don't have the big threat. I mean, that's just what we found, even though I think to Tisha's point, there's clearly all kinds of things happening on a daily basis. You know, there's all kinds of crises that are already there, but when it's not really visible, it is a lot harder to do this kind of organizing work. It's just um, how it is, despite what you may see in your own community. Um, there's a different kind of, not really a different kind of work that has to, to happen, but um, you have to take, I think, extra efforts um, to actually to materialize stuff. So there's just, you just have to dig in harder. I mean, it's, it's a simple way to maybe get out your question. And we can talk in more detail here in a little bit. So what we thought we would do, like I mentioned, is, is just talk about two of the communities who have done the community rights, rights of nature work. Uh, they are in very different parts of the country. Their reason for doing this work came from very two different really reasons. Uh, one is Toledo, Ohio, the other is Lincoln County, Oregon. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to Tish just to talk about um, elements of, of what happened in Toledo. And I'll, I'll talk about um, Lincoln County, and you can, if you can see your screen, you can see already we kind of laid out some of the, the particulars about each place, but we'll, we'll talk through each and add some more detail as we do. Um, yeah, and I think um, what I'm going to, can you go to the next slide, Kai, just so yep. we'll get back to this one, just to kind of give you some background. Um, because a lot of people may or may not know, I don't know if you're not familiar with the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, their issue, they had a water crisis in 2014, where they actually had no water for three whole days at all. Um, and it was because of severe algae blooms within the lake caused by industrial agriculture, they're the main culprit. But what's interesting is the timeline here. The algae bloom's been going on since the 1970s. So this didn't just all of a sudden pop up that year. <laughs> and it was a you know, it was a problem because the water got shut off. So it really got a lot of attention in the community. But what's interesting is you'll see how, you know, in the before even this happened, that these quality agreements between the US and Canada about protecting the lakes. I mean, all the studies that were done between 1995 and 2013, um, look at all the subsidies corporate agriculture received, 26 million in taxpayer subsidies. Uh, so this is all leading up to before the water crisis even that happened in 2014. And then what, so that was obviously the shock to the system. You know, you've, a lot of you have probably read Naomi Klein's, you know, shock doctrine kind of thing. That was the shock that happened in Toledo. Um, what happened then, the people went to the system, like what they're taught to do. You know, they went to their elected, say, oh my God, you know, you, you gotta do something. This can't happen again. They went to the state government. Um, and all that happened is, more studies, you know, we'll give money. The, the governor came and said, oh, at the time Kasich, we'll come up with this plan. We're gonna do more studies. We'll do more testing sooner. So this doesn't, we'll buy more chemicals. We'll buy more chlorine to put in the water. So this doesn't happen again. Um, so that's all after two years of this, they were like, you know what, nothing's happening. And so they just happened. And again, it's sometimes, you know, I always say the stars, I kid people, the stars aligned because we were up in Bowling Green, which is close to 
Toledo, not in Toledo, giving a talk. We were doing a tour throughout Ohio and happened to be there. And some people from Toledo were in the audience and we were talking about rights of nature. And so they actually at that came up to us afterwards and said, wow, do you think we could use this? Because nothing else, this, the, the government's not doing anything. They just keep you know, letting more of these huge farms come in, more pollution happening. And so that's how it all started. They um, worked with us. We don't just come up with cookie cutter laws. The community group was very involved in drafting the language that we showed you with the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. Um, they then had to, in Ohio, we have the ability to circulate, the people have the right supposedly, um, to circulate petitions, to propose laws directly, and then put it on the ballot for people to vote on. What will happen, what you'll see in the Lake Erie Bill of Rights stories, you know, perfect for this. Um, the system did not want the people to vote. They did not want the vote. So they did everything in their power to keep it off. The Board of Elections said to keep it off. We went to the Supreme Court. Um, they ruled against putting the Lake Erie Bill of Rights on the ballot. So again, even taking away that from the peoples because they see what a threat it is. Eventually, because the people could have given up at any stage of this um, initiative process and this effort that they were doing to protect the lake and their water supply and they didn't. So it, it's really a story about persistence of the people there. And finally, they did get it on the ballot. It did pass. And then as if you know the story, what happened is 12 hours later, the big agricultural entity sued to have it overturned. Um, there was a huge amount of money poured into, I should back up a little in the campaign. That was big, over 300,000. The community group raised about 6,000. So definitely a <laughs> um, David versus Goliath kind of story. And it still passed by 61% of the vote. What you also see is the, the court, the judge not letting the people enter the case. They wanted to enter the case. It was their law. You know, They were the ones that proposing rights of nature and the judge would not let them in the case because the farm sued the city of Toledo, which is much different than you know the people of Toledo. The municipality didn't pass this law, the people did. So you know, the court that was in federal court, we also at the same time, right after it passed May of that same year, there was anti-rights of nature language that was slipped into a budget bill. And what it basically says is that no community can pass any law, rights of nature law, language for you know rights uh, in ecosystem, nature at all having rights, and that you cannot represent them in court. So in other words, they can't get, so they shut the courts down to this. Um, we still have other people in Ohio working on rights of nature law. So that's what's important here. It's that the fight continues. It doesn't matter what the court does. There is still another lawsuit going on. We don't hold out much hope. It's three residents in Toledo brought what they call is a pro se lawsuit. And that is um, without an attorney. And they have filed to um, in the county court. So not in the federal court. And we actually have, did have a little win there and that case is still continuing. But um, again, you know, we don't hold out much hope, but the point of it is the attention that it got. And we have other places in the state and in the country that are still proposing rights of nature. And to me, that's the most important thing that can happen from this case. Kai, you wanna take it to Oregon? I will. I will fly us to Oregon from Ohio. <laughs> um, yeah, so the it you know it's in Oregon's case, you know their issue as you can see on the screen here, their their issue is industrial logging. So uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, lots of places out west, uh, very heavily logged still, uh, like other industries, very much corporately controlled. Uh, one of the larger uh, timber companies in Lincoln County is actually an investment corporation, so they're not even uh, let's say even historically a, t a timber operation. Um, so with that has come uh, in more corporatized factory-like practices. Uh, so clear cutting is a very common practice, large, large uh, timber units being clear cut. And as part of that operation, there's a heavy amount of pesticide spray. 
And in Oregon and Lincoln County uh, as well, uh, it's fairly mountainous. Uh, so most of those pesticides are applied aerially. So a helicopter flies over and actually sprays uh, the chemicals. Uh, and this has been going on for decades. Uh, it originally started with Agent Orange. So during the Vietnam era, uh, that Agent Orange that was used as a defoliant uh, in the conflict over in Vietnam was then being used in the timber industry. Uh, also for the same idea of, of, of keeping, in this case, competing plant species from uh, outdoing the commodity trees. Uh, with that, though, heavy amounts of environmental damage came about with that. Um, uh, very much documented uh, damages to human health uh, to the point where uh, alarming rates of miscarriages were transpiring, deformities. Uh, in some cases, uh, babies uh, actually being born with basically the, the most minimum of, of, of brain development. Um, this is the level of toxicity that Agent Orange has on, on humans. So despite all those efforts, uh, even though Agent Orange was eventually ceased, there's been derivatives of that still sprayed today. You know, the people did um, all they could to try to get the powers that be to, to stop. So not so different than Toledo in the sense of a long legacy of environmental harm with very little to no action. And in fact, authorizing the continuation of it. So like Toledo, the people there drafted a law banning aerial spray and in the process recognizing the rights of ecosystems also not to be sprayed. Uh, they too got theirs on the ballot and it was voted in. Um, uh, like Toledo, heavy corporate opposition, um, dollar-wise in the campaign, probably $600,000 spent. Uh, we found out later there was a, a campaign before the campaign paid by the large chemical lobby for the big chemical companies. Uh, they spent probably a million and a half dollars to lobby people against voting for uh, their aerial spray ban. So to Tisha's point, you know, this, this is not just a, um, it's clearly an economic challenge, but it's a political power challenge to, to the corporate entity when you start actually exercising your rights and they don't like that. So they, they pull out all the stops to, to try to dissuade you and uh, convince people otherwise. Um, similar to Toledo, the law was challenged. Uh, right now it's in the appellate court in the state of Oregon. Uh, the case is actually being heard by the appellate court on June 1st. Uh, but also like Toledo, because people decided that they had enough, I mean, taking kind of cue from someone like a Kathy Mirielli back in 2006, that enough's enough. Um, you know, they've got other places now considering the same kind of law, despite the consequences that might come from it. So this is part of that, that movement orientation, that civil disobedience, um, that challenging of unjust law, that, that rights of nature world really is deeply steeped in. Um, so before we kind of hand it off to you to, to talk with each other, I um, just want to kind of highlight, you know, really the, the similarities of what's happening in the rights of nature community rights world. Um, these are just a small, a small comparison of some of what we see as the elements of really movement building, you know, that they start locally, uh, they have a certain view, a certain value system, a certain frame that they're working towards, uh, that they're aiming for structural change. Movements always aim for structural change. If you think about rights of nature, the structural change here is to move nature from being seen as property to being rights bearing. That's a huge tr uh, structural transformation, it's fairly seismic. Uh, and this, the idea of, you know, breaking law to change law, so to Tisha's point earlier about the lunch counter sit-ins, you know, those were all tactics used to, to challenge unjust law, uh, and very similar things happening in the rights of nature community rights world. There's this challenge going on uh, to go after unjust, illegitimate law. Uh, and one last screen before I go away from here, um, if I can get my computer to work. Let's see. Okay, this is just another bullet list of what we see as kind of characteristics of what rights of nature lawmaking looks like at the community level, you know, so that there's usually this, this existing threat uh, or a proposed threat, uh, pipeline coming in, frack well, factory farm, gentrification, something ongoing like pesticide use, whatever it is, the toxic al algae blooms. Um, the second thing is something we haven't really talked about, but that whole structure 
of legal doctrines that operates around the corporate rights, around preemption, nature being seen as property, the regulatory fallacy. We call that the box of allowable activism, that communities are trapped in that right now. And so long as we don't work our way out of that or to dismantle that, we can kind of predict the outcomes. And so a big move of what's happening in the community rights, rights of nature world is people uh, basically saying, we no longer want to be put in that box and we're willing to actually go after those legal doctrines that have put us there. Um, that assertion of self-governance that we talked about, that ability to self-determine, uh, challenging corporate privilege, specifically the corporate constitutional rights, securing rights for ecosystems, the idea of civil disobedience, you know, legalizing in this case to say your law really is unjust, it's illegitimate, and we're going to put new rules forward. Uh, and then also, again, that reconstruction transformation of the system, that it's not about reforming it, it's really about restructuring it, revolutionizing it. And so that takes a different framework uh, that I think Rights of Nature really has helped contribute to. So <clears throat> I think with that, maybe we'll just see if there's any kind of questions before I hand it back to Tish to kind of set up having you guys have a little bit of a discussion with yourself before we all come back as a big group, um, just to kind of digest some of this and talk about the possibilities of moving this kind of work around the Mississippi, um, other rivers, other ecosystems, whatever it might be, but you know, starting to chew on like, all right, if we know that the system really isn't working and we know we have to do something about it and there's examples of how it's actually being done and articulated, what does that look like where I live and what role can I play in actually moving it? So to begin to kind of have some of that conversation, which is a bit of what we dipped into as the lead up to today's workshop, the three different conversations had those kind of elements. Um, and so we kind of want to return to that sort of idea of, of talking with one another. But before we hand it off to you, are there particular questions, comments, um, anything that people want to bring up before we, we break out into little groups? Amy? Yeah, we. I, I know it's been touched on just a little bit, but I'm, I'm curious around conversations and the, the intersectionality and how we really engage with the tribal nations that are in some of these areas. Um, and just kind of want to make sure that we're keeping that on the forefront of our minds and how we, uh, there's a lot of these fights that have been going on and getting together really feels super important. Um, and raising voices. So felt like I just wanted to mention. And Absolutely. I know you guys have a lot of things to say about that. So no, I, I really appreciate it because that's a very good point. I think not only um, critical in the sense of the interrelation between non-indigenous and indigenous or tribal nations, but also if you think about issues, think about how many groups are organized around a specific issue. And then how often do those different issue groups really intersect and work with one another? Um, and in some ways, the, the system has, has created that sort of environment of, of issue-specific activism. Um, but I think we have to get smarter with that and do very much what you were just describing in the sense of supporting tribal nations and vice versa. The same thing I think needs to happen around issues that we have to understand it's the system, it's the structure that's affecting all of these things. And so if we don't deal with the structure, you know, we know again where we end up. So yeah, that's a, a big element that needs to be figured out um, and worked on because uh, with that comes power, right? I mean, it, it's the people power piece. Um, and I think there's a lot of, of good energy out there. It just hasn't really coalesced in the way that it needs to. So. Yeah, maybe that's something to talk about in the small groups is what does that look like? Maybe around rights of nature specifically, you know, how do, how do non-indigenous communities and tribal nations, you know, work together in the state of Minnesota, for instance, or whatever it is, but more and more discussion on that is, is critical. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Yeah, that was, that was one of my questions, you know, how do, how do bring like-minded people together, you know, start small, what have you get the word out, that kind of thing, just come together as a community. I'm, I'm very new. I was from the Minnesota area, but I'm now in North Carolina. I'm appalled at some of the things I see down here. You know, I, I, I actually wish we had kind of like a whistle, whistleblowers network kind of thing for people because I, I'm really appalled at some of the things that I see going on. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's a big it's a big challenge, especially when you edge into the more radical world. And when I say radical, I don't mean in what most people may think of when they think of radical. I, I mean it in the, in the definition that they see it as a structural problem, as a systems problem, you know, which is sort of the anti-authoritarians, the whistleblowers, they all fall in that same category. The system has been very good at isolating those people, those groups um, when they do. Um, so the question is, how do we break through to make sure that those you know, whistleblowers, those anti-authoritarians actually have a platform so that real, real momentum builds from that. That's, I think that's a constant struggle. I think sometimes we get in our own way and then in other ways, the system is deliberate at making sure we don't connect. And so we have to be smart about it. And I think that's why we always emphasize that this is movement work. And so when you take it as movement work, you have to be aware of the forces as well as the shortcomings and the things that we need to work on, which means also getting out of the mindset that we want to reform the system versus change or transform the system. And so many groups are still about going into the system about trying to make it a little bit better. And once you start there, you're not about transforming the system. You're about tweaking it. And that, that doesn't get you to where I think people here want to get to. And so that starting point is so critical. So I think about coming to the conversations, where do we really, what do we really want asking that right question and starting from the right point? Because if you don't, um, you end up back within the system itself, which has been a contributor to why we're at where we're at. It's not about pointing fingers, but it's a different, um, it's a different place. I, I didn't mean to get sidetracked. I yep. just suggestions for small steps on how to help to, to, you know, get others involved in the movement. And I just saw somebody, I'm like, I didn't mean to sidetrack them. No, was, no, I, I didn't see that as I track the at same all. lines. I just suggestion. Yeah. You know, maybe to, uh, to Amy's question around intersectionality, um, maybe that's something you can also throw out in your small group. Maybe others have, have tackled some of the, the very things that you're facing now and could have some suggestions there. Okay. There's a huge, I just want to add, there's a huge education, obviously, for rights of nature, because a lot of people have never heard of it. It's new. And there is a group, I don't know where you're at in North Carolina, but there are some people there, you know, that contacted us that we're working with but you know people don't think rights of nature and in the Toledo that's what they had to try and do too is show people that yeah agriculture is a big culprit but if you have rights of nature in place and that's recognized so if Lake Erie's rights are recognized there's a lot of other issues she's facing you know there's open lake dumping going on um, there's an experiment with industrial wind project that's supposed to go on the lake they want to use her as a guinea pig um, you know, there's just various different issues that she's facing. So there isn't just one, but if that law, if, the, if she was recognized as having rights, you don't have to each of those separately fight, you know, her rights are being violated from all those harms. So it's, it's changing people's mindset instead of individually fighting all these single fight, site fights to her rights are being violated by all those. So the law's already in place. And I see Karuna, you have your hand up, I'm sorry. Yes, my question is, um, what were the legal basis for dismissing a lot of the suits in Ohio? What was the base? What did the Supreme Court say? What did the district court say? What 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 was the legal rationale? Well, a lot of it it depends. I mean, a lot of it is um, in the federal case. It was that they claimed that it was vague. The rights were too vague. They used that as one of the um, criteria. Also, that corporate you know, rights were endangered, like you can't, the other thing is that the state owns the lake, they actually said that language. And so that bit that the Lake Erie Bill of Rights were threatening the state and its ability to, you know, have the power because they were the sole owners of Lake Erie. And so this local community can't pass these laws. I mean, they were all, they're ridiculous, but you know, they'll come up with whatever they can and they use the law as written. And right now the law that's written is protecting corporations and property rights. And so that's why I said the courts will be the last, but all this is about putting pressure on, you know, people see that as a loss, but that's in our minds, we're in a movement, you have to change that mindset um, because the Lake Erie Bill of Rights may have been overturned but there's like Kai said, and I've said, there's other communities. I'm working with communities trying to do a Ohio River Bill of Rights. 
So it's about spreading the information, the education, and as more people hear it and understand it, they are still gonna go ahead and keep pushing it forward. That's how the movement moves forward. Yes, but, but if by asserting that, we still have to counter those other arguments that prevailed in Ohio, for instance. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. and it's more people, but as more people in community after community after community understand it and put pressure, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe they're gonna have to, you know, get in the streets. Maybe they're gonna have to take over the courthouse. I don't know. You know, nobody knows that's the other thing with a movement where this is exactly going to lead, but it has to come from the grassroots and building that pressure upward to change the system. It's not gonna be the system top down giving it to us. I it's often think that there's a possibility mm -hmm. of using the Ninth Amendment as a basis for community rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think um, about that. Mm -hmm. what what often gets sort of not quite understood about this work is it's not one or the other. Um, this isn't this isn't solely legal work. Um, in fact, the legal work, unfortunately, is probably a small percentage of what this work represents. So to Tish's point, it's a lot of ends up being really about political work. Um, and it's through the legal work that often the political work can build. So Clearly, it's looking about how to how to do the best legal arguments within the system as it stands, and figuring out different ways of which to make those arguments in the hopes that you, you keep evolving it through the system. But knowing how the system functions, you also need to understand that as you do that work, how do you build political power to then actually rewrite the fundamental structural governing and law elements, so that when you make the rights of nature elements, they're based on a different value system. So it's, it's not going to be something that is one in the courts basically, um, but the legal work still has proven to be helpful and there are things of which to evolve from it. So yeah, whether it's picking up, you know, each state has many versions of the Ninth Amendment, for instance, or states like Pennsylvania have this environmental uh, constitutional amendment that you know, have braided into some of the community rights work. So it is about finding some of those arguments to be made, uh, but also having a healthy understanding that the system really is not uh, really capable ultimately of seeing something like rights of nature. It's gonna come from deeper legislative work that has to go along with the litigation. We wanna really hand it off to you um, to to kind of talk through what you've heard so far, you know, some of these questions about legal work and organizing work and whatever else might be spinning around in your heads um, and just send you off into to different small breakout rooms, um, maybe for about nine, 10 minutes. Um, Tish, did you have anything else you wanted them to consider before I send them off? Well, no, I mean, either one, you know, if you have questions that, about what we presented, maybe what we didn't present, or even then thinking about, you know, how you might move this forward, questions about that, specific, more specifics um, with rights for the Mississippi. So any of those, and then when we come back, you know, share it with the larger group. Ty, are you gonna divide them into groups? Is that what Yeah, I'm ready to go here. Okay. Um, for those who haven't done uh, the small breakout rooms before you'll, uh, when I open, when it's called opening the rooms, you have an option then to, to, to accept. So just hit accept and you'll get sent off with uh, some other folks, get a chance to meet each other and kind of talk through these things. And then after about eight minutes, it'll give you a minute warning and then you'll come back um, to the full group from there. So here we go. For those that haven't gone, have you not gotten an invite or just making sure? All 
Are you other are the others exercising self-determination not to go to small group? Yes. <laughs> And it feels really good, actually. Yeah, I have to. I have to partially respect that. So, since yeah. part of this is really about being disobedient for what you think is just. So, <laughs> I don't want to interfere on your own time for a break. If you no, need no, to. we're 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 fine. We just want to make sure that it, that people have a chance to kind of talk with one another versus just listening mm -hmm. to us. So, sure. Yeah. No, I just have some. Yeah, and I don't if. I know Amy and Jean and Frank are here, so um, I just have some a burning desire with some thoughts. I'm teaching a course on the rights of nature and multi-species justice right now. Actually, it's called Worlds Beyond the Human. So I'm, I, I have some things I'd like to ask if you have a moment. Yeah, I guess we're on we're on small group right now. So. Yeah. Okay, Amy, I just want to be mindful that I know you're going to do a pre presentation. So if you needed to address something, please go ahead. Nope. Okay. I'm, I, I think I didn't get a sign because I might be one of the co-hosts. So I'm going to all sit in here or go to another one of the rooms. You go right ahead, Chelsea. Okay. Well, thanks for your time. Um, kind to, this is really exciting for me. We've been reading uh, Boyd's work on uh, the rights of nature, that text, and then I'm coupling it with a lot of other spaces. I look at this, I'm an environmental anthropologist. So I look, I teach this in a, in a, like you were saying, this is not just legal, but political, but to me, it's ideological and ontological and all the, all the isms, right? So um, I'm, I'm wondering about this equation of property rights, corporate rights, and the commodification, right? So, so it looks like the phase of rights of nature, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're in is pushing back on the commodification of nature towards the inherent flourishing and evolution and restoration of nature. I'm one, and, and using that is community rights is sort of the tool that then interrupts that um, process. Um, and inside that is this anti-individuation. And so I'm wondering if like the fourth phase of rights of nature is going to then incorporate challenging private property rights as well. And if you've thought along those lines and if there is some discourse around that. Yeah, I think that um, it's interesting so is one way to get at that question in the, in the progression of the work, for instance, you know, publicly talking about the, the, the reasoning behind the constitution and that it's a property document mm -hmm. was not an easy thing to talk about eight, nine years ago in public, you know, cause it's so sacrosanct. Um, there's so much mythology built up around the constitution itself. Um, that's gotten a lot easier. Um, Rights of nature as a concept, as we mentioned, it, it is in this other phase now where it's not as, it's not really, I mean, it's clearly laughed at and attacked by, by the corporate interests, but I think overall it's something of which now it's about how does that interact with individual rights as well as property rights? So there's this sort of like, kind of this, this battle going on between the rights assertions and trying to figure that out and what that looks like. The, the bigger discussion on property rights itself really isn't being done as openly as it needs to be. Yeah. Uh, we have a colleague of ours that wrote a book called Wealth Rules the World, which is an attempt to get at that bigger question of property rights. But clearly, I think you understand inherently within rights of nature is, is very much a, a challenge or attack at dismantling the notion and the power of, of property rights. And I think getting in that, you know, delineating what we mean by property rights. You know, you have big property and you have small property, you know, there's your house, but then there's also the permit, you know, to put the pipeline in. Well, guess what? That's property. So what does that property look like versus, you know, shelter for an individual family and being able to split those things apart. But I think you're right. And whether that comes into another phase or it's integrated into the expansion of rights of nature and really the idea of communal rights or community rights. Um, that's something that's going to have to be contended with. And obviously the sooner the better, but it's, it's also a very difficult cultural, you know, question because, you know, even for the, probably the most staunch progressive, you know, it probably will start to raise hair on people's necks when you start going after the notion that property rights, um really need to be dealt with which is really also 
and in some ways already happening, you know, with the proposal of land back, because right, I mean, land back has to get at, you know, re reassessing, you know, who has access, maybe more so, or who has rightful connection to, perhaps versus who owns, you know, again, that, that language piece has to come into play. But yeah, that's exactly a huge what I was thinking, too. And, and just recently, I was in a panel that talked about that how land back isn't just material. So the way that you just broke it down as well as this, the pr private property or property in general, not being only material, but uh, the sacro, it, it's the next sacrosanct horizon right and potentially in the movement um right. yeah but i think there's some really clear linkages with land back and also i like how you linked it back to self-determination and sovereignty too because this is once again where indigenous nations are you know the leaders in this in in determining self-determining and also um hunkering down with community rights instead yeah, of individual and also if you probably know it's, it's also a huge challenge for tribes I mean, mm -hmm. especially under the, the federal construct of how federally recognized tribes have to operate. You know, I was just with a tribe today and, you know, it was interesting having them talk about the political realities of what the tribal government does. And they as non-tribal government people, but members of their tribe. And it was so similar to so many of the, the non-Indigenous communities that we work with because of of again, who the authority is that you have to talk to and who gives you permission and can we really act? And um, so there's so many parallels, which I think Amy's point is a good one. It's like, there's so many things to learn from each other. Um, the deeper learning clearly of traditional, you know, knowledge needs to be understood by non first peoples. But I think there's a lot of similarities, like we're going through a lot of the same things. And if we could hear each other that there's a lot of parallels, even if we come from different cultural backgrounds, I think we gain power with that. So um, yeah, that's a, a, a big piece to kind of work through. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a lot and that's, yeah, we run into that in communities all the time. I mean, and I, I've talked to communities and said, well, is it right that the, the richest person in town that owns the most land, maybe high above, gets to then, you know, do what he wants with the land that maybe affects everybody at the bottom of the hill. He's at the top of the hill, but he owns the most property. So getting them just to start thinking differently about private property rights, because, you know, we assume that means, you know, some people think, well, I'm going to protect it. Others are thinking they don't realize in our system of law, that means you can destroy it, you can harm. But again, that idea, do you have the right then to harm the entire community's water supply or the entire community's air that they breathe? So, so you're with saying responsibility, that. you know, it comes with responsibilities. Right. So you're differentiating the notion of private property, saying it's asymmetrical based on wealth accumulation. And that's what people aren't realizing. Yeah, so interesting. Mm -hmm. This is so great. Thank you. I, I, I want to talk about green criminology, but yeah. <laughs> the next hour of the workshop, huh? Yeah. Um, who was just talking? Who, who was I just talking with? Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Was there, is there water there? There's a, about six acres of wetland, yes. There might be a, a route for wetland protection. To go that way with the um, the so our um, the watershed district. Have you tried that? Well, it's a very small portion of the property, and it won't. Um, the the wildlife needs the entire parcel in order to flourish. So thank you for that thought. You're continuing, yeah, your small group into the big group and the rest of us, we don't know exactly what you're talking about. Well, yes. <laughs> you should have been in room four. Yeah. No, <laughs> darn. Wow. <laughs> no, that's good. I'm glad though. Yeah, but the rest of us, what are they talking about? Um, but no, so if someone wants to like discuss what, I don't know if we have any time left actually now I'm looking at this I don't know Amy how much or Susan you guys want here at the end we took your time. You just need a couple minutes. Okay. Um, I guess if there's some burning question that came up in your small groups that somebody wants to get out and we'll try to answer it really quickly. No, you guys answered your own questions I like that. <laughs> 
One thing I just, because I, I can put the sign-in sheet, I'm going to put the sign-in sheet back into the chat one more time and we'll have people's emails um, and we absolutely want to continue these conversations. And so there's ways that we can stay connected um, to come up with more ideas. It sounds like there were some interesting conversations in the group. So um, I will drop that. Yeah, and just to put you more on the spot, Amy, not just you, but your group, I mean, our understanding is there's really strong interest in, in actualizing rights of nature work in your communities there and ideally putting rights of nature laws in place for the Mississippi and for Mississippi, sorry, uh, and otherwise. So it's going to take a, a critical mass. Um, and so having these events like tonight and the other ones are really about uh, finding like-minded people to to do the heavy lifting and so yeah i i would encourage you to you know if you're not already connected to the group you know obviously put put your name in the list there and find other ways to to keep talking to one another you know we we do these things and we end up you know being conversation starters and people want to talk to us at points even after the workshop where we, we do that and we're happy to but it's also critical that you as a community you know, talk with one another as much as possible and don't wait for events to do so, just reach out to each other. Teresa? Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that uh, a lot of people in outer greater, call it greater Minnesota, face is the, um, you know, that we are an agricultural state and agriculture has huge impacts on, on, the environment and there's a ton of tiny tiny towns and so even bringing up for example tiling uh in agriculture which you know floods rivers and dumps all the chemicals in the rivers and you know it's like there's so much um there's so much shushing of these of this even just opening the conversation that it feels in some ways it feels impenetrable so like having some clues on how to do that alternatives you know when people have when people's livelihoods are based in commodification of the environment where do we go with that that's it Nothing big. <laughs> okay, so we want to, I'm sorry, we want to be mindful oh, no. of everyone's time. Um, so I really want to just say so much appreciation to Tish and Kai um, for leading this and sharing all your knowledge and your work with us. Um, and to everyone else that joined us, we're so thankful that you were here. The Rights of Mississippi River Group meets every other Saturday. So we're meeting this Saturday from 10 to noon. Go to our Facebook page. We try to post relevant things for people all over. If it was outstate, right now there's something on there about a threatened spring in Eden Prairie. Um, so we, we try to support movements all over in whatever way we can, if nothing else, by putting it on our Facebook page. Um, we do a lot with line three. Um, so please go look at our page. If you'd like, come to our meeting. Know that we will reach out to you again in some way to think about what we can do um, with this group of people so that we can give you all access to each other. And if you choose, keep getting together in some fashion and, and keep growing and supporting each other in this paradigm shift. Um, so, and I want to say also our mission is healing communities and water because they go together. And that's something that we are, we're focused on getting legal rights for Mississippi River. And we also wanna support all kinds of communities to support clean water and the people that are made of water. So in our two minutes left, we usually sing out. Uh, we, I'll, I'll let Amy introduce the song and sing us out. Um, and then if you have anything to say, you can put it in the chat, but otherwise we just sing out our meetings. Amy? 
Yes. So again, we want to be mindful of everyone's time, but I think I can do this in this time. So there is a, um, the Nibby song, which is a water song. And it was written by a woman named Doreen Day and her grandson. And I will, I'm kind of trying to multitask. So I will put it in the chat so you can read the story of how the water song came to be. Um, there are many other water walker stories around the song. There are multiple women who um, have brought the song to life walking around various bodies of water, some singing to the water every single day. And uh, it's become part of what we do in our meetings to um, sing the song, uh, to kind of bring it back into uh, a different kind of form of life as we talk about water. So, I am, like I said, just doing a bit of multitasking. I am going to put a link. Actually, I can probably share this. I'm gonna share the um, words just so you can sing that, see this. Um, everyone can see that. Uh, so I will be singing it in Ojibwe and um, we sing this song for rounds. So thanks again, everyone for joining. Mi pe kiza ke iko ki mi kwecho we ni mi ko ki ja we ni mi ko ni pe love you. We thank you. We respect you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye. Beautiful, bye. beautiful voice, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>